Welcome home. This is Audio EXP for the 20th of February 2021. And the title of this episode is Anime Awards. And is Vampire coming to Roll20? There have been over a hundred new RPG and RPG related Kickstarter launches since we last spoke. ZineQuest 3 is still going. Okay, here's a question for you. Would you say ZineQuest or ZineQuest? Even though I know the word is a contraction of magazine, I've been saying Zine. A hundred Kickstarters is a lot. There's been more this week than the week before, although launch week two weeks ago is still the largest. I don't cover all the Kickstarters one by one on Geek Native. Usually, I would never do more than one Kickstarter a day, but I've been doing two for the season. Why? That's a fair question. It's not for the clicks, and the data shows I'd be better off sticking to cosplay and funny comics if I wanted the clicks. It's because that I think curation is essential for any online community, and because the headlines on the blog alone can be enough to remind people that they wanted the game. And there's a timer associated with each Kickstarter. I also want to mix and match to promote little indie games as well as big headliners. The cost is, for me, not just in hosting fees, but in time. Routinely itemised RPGs 88 was a bit of a nightmare this week. And I'll tell you what happened. I had about 120 of the 125 Kickstarters mentioned in that weekly RPG news report already in a spreadsheet on Thursday night. And all I had to do was compile the newsletter, adding a sentence to each, plus the usual news from around the web, interviews and reviews. The summary was due to be written on Friday. I guess all I'm saying here is, I started early. Suddenly, I was nowhere close to finishing the write-up and it was nearly 6pm on Friday. At 6pm, the automated schedule sends out the Daily Digest newsletter. I wrote up to a few minutes before 6pm, and then hit publish on the unfinished newsletter. The goal was to make sure the headlines and graphic made it to that Daily Digest, and then, without changing the URL, over the next 10, 20 or 30 minutes, I could update the post and finish it. Except... Sometimes WordPress is evil, and I must have left it too late. The weekly news summary did not make the Friday email. Instead, it will appear in Saturday's roundup and right at the bottom. It's not a disaster. It's just frustrating, and a good example of why consistency is good. I bet people are wondering where the Friday news is. It's been a busy week, and there's a heady collection of news in this Highlights podcast, so let's get cracking. That 6pm deadline is sneaking closer for the transcript that accompanies this podcast too, and you'll find the link to that in the show notes. Crunchyroll, which sold for nearly $1.2 billion to Sony, had their anime awards online this year, and Geek Native has written about most, but not all, of the winners over the last 12 months. Let's butcher some names and try and wade through the list of winners. Anime of the Year goes to Jujutsu Kaisen. Best Animation, Keep Your Hands Off Aizuken. Best Fantasy goes to ReZero, Starting Life in Another World, Season 2. Best Drama goes to Fruits Basket, Season 2. Best Comedy goes to Kagu Osama, Love is War. And Best Girl goes to Kayuga in Kayuga Sama, Love is War. Best Boy is Shoyu Hinata, in Hayoku to the top. Best protagonist is Katrina Kliss in My Life as the Villainess, All Roots Lead to Doom. Best antagonist is Sukuma in Jujutsu Kaisen. Best fight scene is the one where Deku fights Overhaul in My Hero Academia Season 4. Best score is won by Kevin Penkin for Tower of God. Best Director is Muzaki Yusa of Keep Your Hands Off Izuken. Best Couple is Anasa Yuzaka and Tusaka Yuzaka in Tokunawa Over the Moon. Best Opening Sequence goes to uh, Wildside in Beastars 
And the best ending sequence is Lost in Paradise in Jujutsu Kaisen. Well, I'm going to have to listen to myself struggle through that list several times while editing this, but we made it. As a reward, let's talk about prizes and freebies. Geek Native has a copy of the card game Bahamas to give away. Sorry, you need a mailing address in the United Kingdom to take part in that. In Bahamas, you are one of many thieves on a crashing plane. As your ride hurtles towards the ground, all you have to do is grab what cash you can and, and here's the important part, one of the few parachutes and leap off the plane. The winner is whoever lands is still alive and has the most money. This week, Geek Native mentioned several free-to-download RPGs, but the one I want to talk about in this podcast is the cyberpunk enthromancy. It's not normally free, but this month I'm able to give digital copies to Geek Native patrons. Thank you for your support. As usual, there are a few days for you to join Matron, back the site and still qualify for the gift as I don't want to be petty. Also this week, I posted the RPG Publisher Spotlight with N Publishing. That's the N Publishing which spun off from the RPG news site N World. We touched on N Publishing's future work with the awfully cheerful engine, a rules light system for action comedy RPGs about the 5th edition advanced rules called Level Up, and of course Judge Dredd. I always want to talk about future plans when I get hold of a publisher. I think that's the most exciting thing to discuss. That's the stuff you can't find with Google, and that's what only they know. Understandably, end publishing can't reveal too many plans though. No publisher can. I tried the same thing in a quick Q&A style interview with Roll20 and Renegade Game Studios. The two companies had announced a partnership to bring the Wardlings 5th edition RPG to Roll20. I wanted to explore what the partnership meant. I asked. I asked point blank whether Vampire the Masquerade and World of Darkness games would be coming to Roll20. Neither Emily Floyd of Roll20 or Sarah Erickson from Renegade would say. Renegade, you see, are Paradox's new publishing partners for the in-house again World of Darkness RPGs. And surely making a game available on Raw20 counts as publishing. Mind you, surely Paradox could work directly with Raw20 on that. Maybe. And this is pure speculation. The computer games company Paradox has the programming chops to do their own virtual tabletop. Wouldn't that put the cat among the pigeons? However, although this was a written interview, I sensed knowing smiles to my response. I would not now be surprised at all to see the World of Darkness on Roll20. Roll20 also published their 2020 Q3 report. I did not see it go live. Weirdly, the article is dated October 15th, 2020. However, everybody else reported it as a freshly published piece. And I think they're right. I don't think I've seen that data shared before. Anyway, it gives D&D 5e a 53% share of the platform with homebrew or otherwise uncategory games coming in next with 14%, and Call of Cthulhu in third place with a little over 11%. The platform that I did write about this week is Mindflare.io. Mindflare is another attempt to build a looking for group solution that's not tied to a virtual tabletop. You can use it to offer out your GM skills, or look for players, or both. You can use it for online games or traditional around-the-table games. It's a tough nut to crack because people won't use Mindflare unless there's a chance of it working. For there to be a chance of it working, Mindflare needs people to use it. So how do you get that initial surge of interest? I think sites like Warhorn or Tabletop Events should get into the space. People are already using those platforms to book places at gaming tables, but for conventions. A simple tick box could be used for gamers to say, yes, if somebody else is offering a similar game outside this convention in the next three months, then I'd like to hear about it. For now though, Warhorn and similar sites are sticking with you know, those, those conventions. Speaking of which, Pazio has confirmed that PazioCon 2021 will happen uh, May 28th all the way through to May 31st for that event. And you can find it in the Geek Native convention calendar. And that's already looking pretty busy for this year. In publishing, though, doesn't think we'll see a UK Games Expo this year, despite the convention insisting that it will go ahead in some shape or form. 
finding people to game with is hard. That's probably why we've seen a boom in solo RPGs and duet RPGs in the last 12 months. This week, the duet RPG Beowulf Age of Heroes was released digitally. A duet RPG is one that's designed for a GM and just one player. As you can imagine, Beowulf has had to suitably hack its 5e core to make those changes. My ZineQuest adult mind thinks I back the project and kick to Arter. Maybe there's a physical copy in the post coming to me later. Here's a I can't find someone to game with nightmare story. It starts off as a good story though. For the next few weeks, you can buy raffle tickets to win two nights of D&D in Warwick Castle. It's for comic relief. You'll learn actual sword, actual archery and falconry. One of the prizes is a D&D session with professional DM critical role guest Mark Humes. You get to bring four friends. And here's a nightmare. What if you can't think of four people you know well enough to meet for a real life encounter in Warwick Castle? And yet you've won that top prize. How on earth do you tackle that one? Oh, please, don't let my paranoia put you off. Those tickets are for charity. The Bundle of Holding are also running a special charity offer. It's the Bundle Birthday, as the site turns eight years old. The catch is this. The games are usually free, but you get one tier by donating $1 to the RPG Creators Relief Fund, and you get both levels of the bundle for a $2 donation or more. There are more traditional bundles on offer this week though. The bundle of holding has Old School Cool with games like Vagabonds of Diffed, Doctoria City of the Sea of Glass and Sharp Swords and Sinister Spells in it. Humble Bundle has an RPG deal too. The agreement is with Modifius Entertainment who have made the Fallout Wasteland Warfare RPG part of it. That's the first of two Fallout RPGs that Modifius is working on. It's the one that's an expansion of their Fallout Wasteland Warfare skirmish game, and that's why many of the other downloads in the deal are STL files to print to, to 3D print more of those models. I'm waiting for the second of the two. I quite like the 2D20 system, and I'd be happy to see a Fallout RPG use it. There's also the Post-Human Saga RPG announced this week, another post-apocalyptic RPG that has my attention. In addition to my post-apocalyptic interest, I am interested in the fact that the post-human saga RPG will use the RPG system previously found in Studio Agate's Shadows of Easter End Dark Fantasy RPG. As a result, Studio Agate is converting those rules into a standalone engine that currently has the working title, The Story Arc System. I suspect we might see other interesting titles using the Story Arc System, it could be a rising player in 2021. Sadly, this week, there's news of a falling player in 2021. Fantasy Flight Games have announced that the Legend of the Five Rings card game will finish. The organised play for it will also stop. However, Legend of the Five Rings isn't going away completely. Fantasy Flight Games say two things. One, that Edge Studio is still working on the Legend of Five Rings RPG, and two, there are new Legends of Five Ring games coming. They don't say whether they are working in those L5R games though. I'm more hopeful for Edge and the RPG, although Edge seems pretty focused on their reboot of the Midnight RPG in 5e right now. We can't make it through a whole podcast without mentioning 5e or Wizards of the Coast of course. So let's also talk about the legal row with ACD distribution. We've talked about Watsy settling out of court with the Dragonlance authors and with Gale Force 9 in previous weeks. This week, here's a story in which they didn't and won. Wizards did not want to work with ACD Distribution any longer and try to end the contract. ACD Distribution said that would be a breach of contract. So far, the judges have sided with Wizards of the Coast. As a result, ACD Distribution, who once helped sell more than 20 million worth of Wizards of the Coast products in a single year, look set to lose their license with the Hasbro company and must also pay Wizards $250,000 in legal costs. It's gone to appeal. Lastly, I want to remind you that it's International GM's Day on the 4th of March. I'm tempted to buy a silly card, a silly thank you card for mine. What will you do? 
And on that note, let's wrap there. So please keep safe, stay out of melee range, and we'll speak next week.